Eric McGinnis, 16 years old. He was a part of our family like uh, anything else. His body pulled from the St. Joseph River five days after he disappeared. The headlines read, Black Benton Harbor Teenager. They describe Eric as a black male that's breaking into cars in St. Joe, Michigan. Thief. A 16-year-old thief, largely from a motor vehicle. Investigators ruled Eric's death an accidental drowning, despite this witness. What did you see? Okay, I seen him arguing, and then I seen Curtis kick him in the head. What really happened that night on the pier in St. Joseph? For 30 years, questions lingered, but the river kept the secret. Eric's death wasn't an accidental drowning. But then we just kept seeing more and more people, and we thought, I mean, when is this going to stop? I mean, how many people are chasing this kid? He was murdered. He said he had did a roundhouse kick and kicked Eric in the head, and he fell in the St. Joseph River. and welcome to The River, an ABC 57 News special investigation. I'm Brian Connie Bear here on the South Pier at the mouth of the St. Joe River, just off Silver Beach in beautiful Lake Michigan, where 31 years ago, Eric McGinnis was murdered. The 16-year-old Benton Harbor High School student's death was originally ruled an accidental drowning. But after a witness came forward to ABC 57 News, the case was reopened last year, and investigators just determined this was no accident. The meandering St. Joseph River has long been a natural divider between Benton Harbor and St. Joe, Michigan, geographically, culturally, and racially. Benton Harbor is 85% black, poor, and struggling economically. St. Joseph is an upscale beach town full of tourists in the summer and 85% white. But the mysterious death of Eric McGinnis drove that existing division even deeper. Eric stayed, lived with me, helped me raise my kids. Uh, he was a part of our family like uh, anything else. Eric's uncle, Benny Bowers Jr., a retired Michigan State trooper, could not hold back his emotions when describing the teenager he loved so dearly and who often stayed with him. He was fun loving like anything else. I mean, he, he, uh, he wanted me to teach him how to play basketball. He wanted me to uh, do all kinds of things with him, but he was actively involved in different things, but he didn't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. You know. In his heart, Bowers always knew Eric's death was never really an accidental drowning as originally determined. On May 22, 1991, Eric's bloated body was found floating in the water near the train bridge crossing between St. Joe and Benton Harbor. Five days earlier, the night he disappeared, Eric was dropped off at a teen dance spot called The Club, then located at 505 Pleasant Street in downtown St. Joe, and given $5 to get in by his dad. At the time, St. Joe police and a special task force determined Eric shot off some bottle rockets with other teenagers nearby, then allegedly broke into a parked car and stole $4. $44 in cash, all the money, mostly ones, found in his pants, caked with mud and dirt, and still being held as evidence now 31 years later. They describe Eric as a, a black male that's breaking into cars in St. Joe, Michigan. It's a terrible way to, terrible way to start out uh, as far as an investigation uh, of a black boy's death in a white community. Well, he was breaking in our cars. He probably shouldn't have been over here in the first place. That's the way it is portrayed. Multiple witnesses reported seeing the car's owner, Ted Warmbine, chasing Eric on State Street in downtown St. Joe. But Warmbine told police he lost the faster teenager and then went home. Investigators saying at the time, Warmbine had an alibi witness and passed a lie detector test. If we had found a white male in the city of Ben Harbor that had been chased by black males, so I think they would have pursued it a little more aggressively. That report uh, that the Attorney General's office has released to the public, it's not complete by no stretch of the uh, imagination. Statements support that Curtis Pitts was the murderer. Okay, but there's no one to charge and it's closed. That's because Curtis Pitts took his own life 12 years after the crime, shooting himself in the head with a shotgun inside this house in Benton Township.
Two of the other pursuers at the beach that night also died over the years, including Ted Warmbine. And the AG's team says the statute of limitations has run out on any other counts short of a murder charge. But back in 1991, Curtis Pitts was 19 years old and hung out at the club, dating a white girl from St. Joe named Christine Kaiser. Eric had also dated Kaiser, and in 1991, she admitted to police she had sex with Eric in the bathroom at the club. But then they had a fight, broke up, and she started seeing Pitts, who was just named as Eric's killer by the Attorney General's Special Investigations Unit after a witness came forward to ABC 57 News with a first-hand account of what really happened that night. You could actually park on the beach then. Um, there, there wasn't much down there. Michael Batson was 26 years old at the time and at Silver Beach with a friend on May 17, 1991, the night Eric McGinnis was killed. It was a Friday. It had been a little warm out. Show me where you were parked then. We walked to the exact spot Batson, who's now a registered sex offender, and his friend sat in his car, rolling a joint and watching the waves at about 8.30 that evening when they saw something unusual. Black kid was running, and when I first saw him, he had uh, one white guy chasing him. Then, you know, I motioned to my friend to look. Down along the hard packed sand by the water's edge, Batson says the black teen was running with a distinctive greenish coat over his shoulder. Now, why are uh, five people chasing him? Because, you know, one, you know, after the first one, we thought, well, maybe one guy's chasing, then there's a second person, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. And they were all chasing Eric McGinnis? Yes. Eric had looked up, put his arms out, and cocked his head to the side, you know, in a way asking for assistance from my friend and I. But unfortunately, they did not help Eric. They both simply just watched. Michael's friend confirming the entire story to the Attorney General's investigators, saying, quote, a group of people came running by in the shape of a football formation. At first, I thought they were in gym class. Something didn't sit right with me. It put a knot in my stomach, unquote. The pursuers, all five of them, the first one to notice us was the lead pursuer, Curtis Pitts. The same Curtis Pitts, then dating Christine Kaiser, the same girl from St. Joe Eric had dated and may have fought with. They were probably nine-tenths of the way down the beach, and that's when Eric cut through the sand uh, when he got near the pier. We sat here for maybe five minutes and discussed it, and then uh, my friend agreed to ride with me, and we would drive around and try to find the group to, to make sure the person being chased was okay. Batson and his friend drove around, down by the pier, under the M63 bridge along the river, up along the bluff downtown, and back down to Lions Park Beach, finally ending up back in the exact same spot at Silver Beach as it was starting to get dark. The five people chasing Eric suddenly pulled up next to Batson's car, some of them soaking wet. I saw this big yellow car and I recognized a couple of the pursuers were in the back seat. I said, where's the guy? And then I got the answer that he's sleeping in the dune grass. During an exclusive in-depth interview with ABC 57 News, Michael Batson describes for the very first time publicly what happened next. The car then parked and pursuer number two got out and he had the black youth's coat. Describe that coat. It was a green winter jacket. Did it have anything special on it that made it different? It did. It had a fur collar on it. And that description matches the greenish task force jacket with a fur collar sewed on Eric was last seen alive with. I kept asking, you know, where's the guy? Uh, he, he mentioned the coat and asked me if I wanted to buy it. He ended up um, asking me three or four times to uh, buy the coat, and I kept saying no. Then finally he took the coat and wrapped it around his uh, fists and forearms and slammed me into my car very violently. He yelled out to no one in, in, in particular he, uh, and asked how much is a 12-pack of Budweiser and someone answered him and said $15. So I looked and I had 17 or $18 on me and I gave him 15. And uh, right away I went and unlocked my car and uh, popped 
pop my hatch and then put the coat in the trunk. For a few seconds I thought it was over, but it definitely wasn't over because then Curtis Pitts got out of the back passenger side and as soon as he got out he did a goose step, which is more commonly known as a Nazi march. Uh, he came to the uh, front uh, passenger corner of the other car, did a perfect 90 degree turn and came straight for me. I did, couldn't figure out what was going on. I mean, I, I knew it was something bad, something was not right. Um, and as he got close to me, I was watching his feet and his legs and he uh, did a Heil Hitler salute and just shaved his hand right through my hair. And after that, I was really getting worried. I asked you know, where the guy was at and got no answer. Um, there was uh, Curtis telling me that forget what I saw, that it was all a bad dream, that it never happened. Then when I looked back at Curtis, he told me, we can take care of you. And then his fingers started poking me in the chest. Right now, just like we took care of that finger. And then he did another figure eight with his right arm towards Lake Michigan and said, there's the water. I couldn't do anything but say over and over, what did he do? What did he do? What did he do? And my voice was breaking. I was on the verge of crying. And then uh, I was delivered more threats and told once again, you know, to forget what I saw. You took those threats very seriously. I did. They threatened to go after my sisters. I'm the oldest of seven with five younger sisters. At that time, they were all very vulnerable. Did you fear for your life at any point? Of course I did, but I was more concerned about threats made to my family. But that wasn't the first time, nor it turns out the last time Michael Batson says he encountered Curtis Pitts. Curtis was usually a very nice guy. I mean, he, he's, he'd talk to people, but if, if you crossed him wrong, he's the kind that would go and fight, you know, in seconds. Michael describes being bullied almost all his life and says he suffers from anxiety, Tourette syndrome, and stutters at times when he speaks. And after police closed Silver Beach the night Eric disappeared, Michael escaped back up the hill downtown, but then got an ominous phone call. I, I saw in the newspaper five days later that a body was found. And shortly after that, Curtis Pitts called me and said he was coming over. And what happened when he came over? He reiterated all the threats against my family, against me. And he sat there on my couch cross-legged and with his hand tapped his boots and told me, you wanted to know what happened so bad, now you know. Did he tell you exactly what happened? Yes, he did. What did he say? He said when they got on the pier, he had did a roundhouse kick and kicked Eric in the head. And then Eric hit his head once more on the pier before he fell in the St. Joseph River. I tried to mirror what, what he was saying, is that the cops will never figure it out and nobody cares because it's a black kid that would have just gone to prison anyway. Curtis Pitts said that. Yes. ABC 57 News contacted Curtis Pitt's family to get their reaction to the AG naming him as the killer. But the man who picked up the phone called it all lies, cussed, and then hung up. And some people simply don't believe the AG's report. But what if there was a second witness here by the pier that night who tells a very similar story? Have I made any promises, Dan? No. I've talked to you a year or so, maybe two years ago, but they're 93. 93. Back in the 1990s, Daniel Danny Thornton was interviewed by police three times about what happened to 16-year-old Eric McGinnis the night he died. ABC 57 obtaining this exclusive video of a 1997 interrogation by the original lead detective from the St. Joseph Police, Jim Reeves. And speak up clearly because I want to videotape this. Wait for the camera so that I know you. Okay. 
Danny Thornton is not a very likable guy. He's currently serving 20 years in prison for setting a Cass County house on fire with seven people inside, even trapping two women by nailing a bedroom door shut, then torching the place. Thankfully, they all survived. Nicknamed the Mad Hatter, Thornton also claims membership in multiple Benton Harbor Bay street gangs, and his mug shots show the face tattoos to match. Do you know Eric McGinnis? Not personally, no. Seen him at school. Well, what school was that? McCord King. And when were you at McCord King? 91. The same year, Eric went out for a night of fun at a teen dance spot called The Club, then in this downtown St. Joe building. But Eric never made it back home across the river to Benton Harbor. Did you ever go to the club? Yeah, I went to the club on a regular occasion. Were you there the night that uh, Eric supposedly had his last meeting there? Yeah. Uh, do you remember what night that was? It was a Friday night. I don't remember the date. It was, in fact, May 17th, 1991, a warm spring evening, with some people even heading down to Silver Beach in Lake Michigan. But Thornton told police he was downstairs at the underground club with a friend named Dallas first. Did you see Eric? Yeah. What was he doing? At first, really nothing, when he got in an argument with Chris Kaiser. What did you see that led you to believe that they were having an argument? Throwing her hands and then he slapped her. He slapped her? Yeah. What happened to him then? Uh, he was escorted out of the club. Did you go outside with him? Not at that time, no. What did you do? I stayed for about 15 more minutes. So about 15 minutes later, you we went outside? The other guys walked back upstairs, yeah. Do you remember who you walked upstairs with? Me, Dallas, uh, Joe walked upstairs, Curtis walked upstairs, and I don't know, two of Curtis's friends. Curtis who? Pitts. Did Curtis see, uh, Eric and Chris Kaiser have this altercation? I believe he did, yeah. For her part, Chris Kaiser told police she met Eric at the club months before that fateful night. They danced and dated and had sex in a restroom there. She admits they had a fight and broke up. Then Kaiser started dating someone new, a 19-year-old named Curtis Pitts, the same Curtis Pitts named as Eric's killer by Michael Batson and who took his own life with a shotgun 12 years after Eric died, according to his death certificate. I seen Eric break down the bluff, break running down the bluff. I say Curtis and another guy chased him down, and I, I ran down. It was obvious to you that Curtis and somebody else was chasing no, it Eric? No, obvious he was being chased, yeah. We drove up to the, right where the uh, emergency access vehicle road was. We walked up to the part where the sand meets flush with the pier, and we seen Curtis and two other people. Chris Kaiser walked back past us as we was walking up there. Curtis and two other people were out there on the pier. Are you saying that Chris Kaiser had been out on the pier? Yeah, I don't know if she had been on the pier, but she had been out that way because she turned around and walked back past us. Then when we got out there, we uh, seen Curtis, two other people, and Eric McGinnis out there on the pier by one of those ladder areas, I think. Tell me what you saw when you were standing there. Uh, I seen what appeared to be there was arguing because of the throwing of hands and so forth. Then I seen Who was throwing the hands? Both of them. All of them. It's hard it was All four of them. The other two dudes were just standing there basically, but Curtis and Eric were arguing. Was Curtis getting in Eric's face? Not really in his face. I mean, they were about this far from each other. Okay. I seen him arguing, and then I seen Curtis kick him in the head. Eric fall backwards over that the ladder chain thing. And I seen him throw something at him. Were you able to determine what Curtis threw at him? It, had, it would appear to be either wash rocks or bricks or something. But I told you know, I didn't stay to watch the you know, turn and took off. I told Dallas we're out of here. Is there any doubt in your mind what you saw? No. No doubt at all. But at the time, St. Joe police chose not to believe Danny Thornton, saying he failed a lie detector test, was in jail, and wanted a break on his own burglary charges for cooperating. It's important to note that Mr. Thornton and Mr. Batson don't know each other. So uh, they didn't know each other then, and they don't know each other now. But they were telling 
the same story. After more than 20 years with the Detroit Metro Police Department working hundreds of homicides, Special Agent Gentry Shelby now works for the Michigan Attorney General's Special Investigations Unit. My findings, an altercation took place, a verbal altercation took place at, the, at that pier, and that verbal altercation ultimately ended in um, a subject kicking Mr. McGinnis in the head and Mr. McGinnis going in the river. That subject being Curtis Pitts. Yes. And the special agent confirms Eric McGinnis, a black teenager from Benton Harbor, was killed for something involving Christine Kaiser, a white girl from St. Joe. It was our information that it was over a young lady um, that Eric was dating, who ultimately started dating um, Mr. Pitts. ABC 57 News tried to reach Christine Kaiser for her version of what happened on the pier that night, but she moved out of state years ago, and it appears she recently changed her phone number too. In fact, the AG's investigator never got to talk to her either. But back in 1991, St. Joe police did. According to these interview transcripts obtained by ABC 57 News through the Freedom of Information Act, Chris Kaiser denied going to the club or seeing Eric that night. She, quote, stated that on the date in question, May 17, 1991, she was with Curtis Pitts at a party in Eau Claire. She told her parents that she was going to stay the night at a girl's house, although she stayed at a house in Berrien Springs with her boyfriend, Curtis, unquote. But police also obtained a guest sign-in sheet from the club that night. And quote, it was learned that Chris Kaiser and others were at the club that Friday night. And they also interviewed Curtis Pitts himself about a month after Eric was found floating in the water. St. Joe Detective Jim Reeves asking, quote, had you ever heard of Eric McGinnis? Pitts responding, not until recently. I know the dude's dead. That's all I know when they fished him out of the river, and I know I'm catching all kinds of slack for it. And Pitts knew all about the racial tension between the two very different communities on either side of the river. Detective Reeves asking, quote, have you received any threats at all? Pitts responds, no, but I've been getting eyes. Reeves asks, who's been eyeing you? Then Pitts says, quote, I don't mean to sound prejudiced, but they all look the same to me, unquote. And he told police he was never at the club that night either or on the pier, sticking to the same alibi about being at a party all night somewhere in Berrien Springs. Nobody remembers the party out of the, of the witnesses that were alive. Uh, nobody even remember going to that party. And it's, you know, I can speculate as an investigator is probably because the party never happened. You know, you would remember something like that. There was also much speculation Eric may have tried to get back to Benton Harbor across the CSX Railroad Bridge over the St. Joe River after being chased. But Special Agent Shelby determined that was impossible because of these dated and timed handwritten logs from the city of St. Joe and CSX Railroad showing the swing bridge was open to boat traffic, not trains, that night. He couldn't have gotten on there. He would have had to jump in the water to swim to the train bridge to get and then climb up on it, you know, and and the beat and to stay there until it closed, right? That that didn't happen. And back to Michael Batson's credibility for a moment. Shelby also talked to Batson's friend who was with him that night, who backed up the entire story, and even heard some of the threats himself when they were confronted by Curtis Pitts back at Silver Beach. He said he was sitting in the car smoking and he heard Pitts, Mr. Pitts say, if you say anything, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill him too. And when he heard that, that caught his attention and he said he looked up and that's when he noticed that the people were in the car and what was going on. Both the key witnesses, Batson and Thornton, do have criminal records and Thornton is still behind bars, but that doesn't ruin them as witnesses, according to Special Agent Shelby. Just because he's in prison doesn't mean he's not capable of being honest. We all make mistakes, right? But that doesn't mean we can't still tell the truth. And about that party in Berrien Springs, Daniel Thornton told me from prison by phone that was an alibi. He helped Curtis Pitts make up to cover their tracks, and most of them stuck to it, except eventually Daniel Thornton himself. The case became the subject of a 1998 New York Times best-selling book called The Other Side of the River. I know it was 30 years ago, but, um, but for many it feels like just yesterday. So we've 
figured out what happened to Eric, um, and you know, which is really, in, in the end, no surprise to either the family or people in Benton Harbor. It's what they've felt they've known all along. Alex Kotlowitz was writing about race in America for the Wall Street Journal when he came across the death of Eric McGinnis about a year after the 16-year-old high school junior turned up dead across the river in St. Joe. I got obsessed with Eric's case, and I was determined to try to get to the bottom of it, and I failed. And I got to say, the, my first reaction is, what did I miss? And Kotlowitz was immediately struck by the depth of the divide across the St. Joseph River. I think anybody who passes over that bicentennial bridge from one town to the other can't be struck by the stark differences between these two communities. One, you know, uh, predominantly white, fairly prosperous, the other predominantly black and struggling. And that for, that's America. What do you make of the report that came out? Given the corroboration by Daniel Thornton, by Michael Batson, by this other individual who was in the car with Michael Batson, um, that the essence of the story is absolutely true. Eric was murdered, murdered at the hands of white men or teenagers, and murdered apparently because he had been dating a white girl. This, I think, was a, a, a racial crime. Um, and so I think first there's got to be some acknowledgement of that. Do you think that divide is still as wide as it was back then? Have we made any progress? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, there's been reason for progress in the last 30 years, but for every step forward, I feel like sometimes we take two steps back. So I don't know how much things have changed. I think that river, and I, I say this metaphorically, I think that river is still very wide and very deep. We are here today because justice was so easily and conveniently covered up. 31 years to the day after Eric's death, Benton Harbor Mayor Marcus Muhammad was determined to honor his former high school classmate, both of them in the Tigers class of 1993, though Eric never made it to graduation day. I have on red today to represent the blood of Eric McGinnis and to represent the blood that's on the hands of the city of St. Joseph. Mayor Muhammad and others hanging a wreath on the South Pier in Eric's honor, and also calling on the former prosecutor who handled the original case in the 90s, Dennis Wiley, who's now a sitting Berrien County judge, to resign and answer detailed questions about what Wiley knew about Curtis Pitts, Michael Batson, and Daniel Thornton before closing the case as an accidental drowning back in 1993. In order to arrive at justice, you must have the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm not aware of any conspiracy. Steve Newbecker is the current public safety director in the city of St. Joe. He points out none of the officers from the original 1991 investigation are still with the department. And it was his team that actually got the long dormant investigation back up and running. Approximately a year and a half ago, we received new information on this case. The case was reopened and eventually turned over to the Attorney General's office. I, I want nothing more than closure to the family, the pain and suffering that they've endured for 31 years. I want nothing more than St. Joe and Benton Harbor to come together. For a police agency to investigate his crime, this murder, and incorporate so many people and didn't follow through on the evidence that was apparent. So that, that frustrates the family and, and pisses us off and uh, we're not satisfied. But Eric's uncle, Benny Bowers, the retired Michigan State Trooper, is now calling for a federal hate crime investigation using the new Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act approved in Washington. I'm not an attorney I'm not, and I was never a detective, but there's some things that are so obvious in this case that it makes you say, what were you thinking about other than saying, I'm trying to salvage the reputation of an all white police department all white community. The frustration and pain still boiling over when he talks about his nephew. He was a regular kid, right? Yeah, he was. <sighs> yeah, he was, Brian. These are mad tears, man. No one can really blame Benny Bowers for still being angry over what happened to his nephew, Eric McGinnis, 31 years ago on this pier right here. But he still hopes the final chapter of this story about the river is yet to be written, and Eric will finally get some measure of justice.
If you'd like to learn more about the McGinnis case, read the Attorney General's report for yourself and other key documents, just go to our website, abc57.com, and click on The River. I'm Brian Connie Bear, ABC 57 News.